welcome back to the post-lunch session here at ICDRI 2023. We do hope you had a hearty lunch, and for those who are joining us from across the globe, we hope you've settled in well, and all of you are looking forward to this session, which is on bridging infrastructure investment gaps for all, risks, vulnerability, and profitability. According to the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, an additional investment of 90 trillion US dollars is needed in sustainable infrastructure by 2030 to achieve the sustainable development goals. In order to bridge the gaps, it is necessary to consider the vulnerability and profitability of infrastructure projects. This session thus will deliberate on how projected and current infrastructure investment decisions can be risk informed and facilitate the bridging of resilient and sustainable infrastructure investment gaps. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Dhruba Purkayastha, who is the India Director for Climate Policy Initiative and will be moderating this session. He has over 25 years of experience to his credit, which includes management consulting, investment banking, and international development financing, and has worked on those profiles across different countries in Asia. Over to you, Dr. Purkayastha, for commencing the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. And let me start by welcoming this illustrious panel. I, I believe some of us on the panel are uh, on a virtual mood. They may join in during their times, but just to start with the panel comprises uh, Ms. Ikushuhi Ayahan, Secretary General Insurance Development Forum, Dr. Satyapriya Rath, Additional Secretary of Finance, Government of Odisha. He would, I believe, be virtual, and so would Ikosuhi be virtual. Neha Kumar, Head of South Asia Programs Climate Bonds Initiative. Mr. Miteli Kama, Acting Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Rural and Maritime Development and Disaster Management, Fiji. And Mr. Matthew, Head of Infrastructure and Finance for Resilience Unit, UNDRR. Mr. Ajay Rao, Regional Managing Director, South Asia, USDFC and Dr. Anand Patwardhan, Professor and Senior Fellow, Center for Global Sustainability, University of Maryland. Uh, extending warm welcome to you all to this very important discussion on financing resilient infrastructure, infrastructure investment gaps, and if I may, as, as sort of, in, <coughs> sort of uh, not putting a certain order to it, but uh, if I can see, uh, Madam Eko Shui, the first question goes out to you uh, in terms of, uh, can you hear us first? Am I clear to you, Eko Shui? Yes. yes. yes I Thank you. you. Yes, I can hear so, you. So, co coming back to the point and as from the Insurance Development Forum, what are the existing gaps in risk information affecting resilient infrastructure investment, particularly for low-income countries? and may include SIDS, and how do you think insurance sector can contribute to A, improving financing resilient infrastructure, and also contribute to developing better risk information in the economy? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this important convening and all with all the other uh, distinguished panelists. Um, and sorry, I'm not able to be in the room with you. And thank you for, I think, a really excellent question. Um, so from my perspective, I think a major challenge when we think about this space and to the question that you raise is really around sufficiency of data um, and access to data. Um, but addressing this gap in terms of the information required to drive investment in resilience infrastructure is not just simply about data itself. Um, because this information needs to be accessible, shared, and also has to be able to be used. So I will focus on three areas where I think there are existing gaps or other challenges in terms of how uh, risk information can be better leveraged to inform investments in infrastructure in low and middle income um, and also SIDS. The first I would say is technical, um, lack of data, technological challenges uh, for presentation of information at relevant geographical scales. A lack of conceptual clarity, I think, is also a challenge that we see within this space. Uh, low technical capacity or the need to strengthen capabilities within many of the countries that we are engaged in, 
in terms of risk analytics skills. Um, in addition to this, I think that there is also a need for greater focus in terms of enough flexibility uh, to account for uncertainty in terms of the information that we use uh, to inform these investments. And I think that we can see that clearly when we think about uh, the developments around climate change modeling. The second challenge that I think there is that exists within this space is really more, much more around uh, the operational. So the reality is that risks must be assessed translated first into recommendations and then into a plan of action. Uh, there are also decisions that will need to be made critically in terms of costs associated with this. Um, and there's often difficulty in terms of interpreting some of the risk information that's available um, and matching them in terms of the application or informing uh, the decisions that need to be made. So I think that there is a challenge, not only technical, but also on the operational end in terms of how we leverage this information. And then the third element I, I think is worth focusing on is around institutional. So often a mismatch in terms of existing policies, how they seek to leverage uh, information, how that matches or reconciles with political cycles and incentives uh, so that the right decisions can be made to drive finance where, where it is needed. So that for me, I, I hope addresses the first part of your question in terms of what do we see as some of the existing gaps um, affecting uh, uh, resilient infrastructure investments in low middle um, income and SIDS countries. Uh, the second part of your question, which is really the role that insurers can play, um, perhaps I can, I can start off by stepping a bit back to say that the practice of understanding risk is really the foundation to reducing it. Uh, so risk decision making obviously can be a difficult process involving judgment and compromise, which I referenced earlier. Um, but um, in order to inform and improve resilience, we have to be more deliberate in terms of how we use data to drive our decision making processes. And so the institution that I represent, the Insurance Development Forum, which is led by the insurance industry, but also with the public sector, specifically the World Bank and the United Nations, is really about how do we leverage those technical capabilities to drive resilience building, if it is for infrastructure or in other um, applications. So from my perspective, there are a number of ways in which the industry uh, can contribute uh, to this um, issue, and I will focus on, on just four. The first, I think, is around strategic risk assessment. Uh, global companies survive by building complex portfolios of diversified risk, and this is not unlike the challenges that many governments, particularly in developing countries, uh, but also developed countries, face. Um, the private sector, and particularly the insurance industry, uh, can be an expert in informing how governments treat to some of these risks um, and bringing to bear better understanding of what the exposures and vulnerabilities are. The second is also, I think, uh, uh, in terms of an active contribution, is really more around operational applications. Uh, perhaps, um, and I think it is perhaps the most valuable in terms of the skills that the industry can bring to this exercise. And that is really taking not only academic research in multiple disciplines, as well as scientific data and observations, uh, and trying to apply that to real decision making, as we will hear, I'm sure, from the other panelists in terms of understanding of exposure as it relates to infrastructure and what can be done to manage that. The third area which I think that the industry can provide valuable input is understanding of uncertainty. The industry has, I think, learned a lot in terms of spotting where data is unreliable uh, and also helping to inform what level of uncertainty is acceptable. So, for example, having a flood map uh, or a full probabilistic model is of no use in decision making unless the context and the provenance of the analysis is also understood. And I think that this is where public private partnerships, where you can have a blend of the understanding and the incentives and the drivers behind the public sector, uh, can converge with some of the interests uh, and the skills and the capabilities that exist with the private sector. Uh, and the fourth element, and I'll be, be brief here, is really the language of risk. So if governments and regulators want to engage with international markets for domestic or domestic market development, there should be an opportunity to also do that on equal footing. And I think that the private sector can bring to bear uh, in terms of capacity building to support um, strengthening government ownership and capabilities on this front. Um, also working, I think, in, term, in tandem with domestic insurance markets to build greater understanding and presence in terms of how these risks are managed. And then finally, also in terms of the analytical tools uh, to support some of these conversations and decision-making processes. So I hope that that gives you hopefully some sense of the ways in which we see the industry being able to contribute um, as it relates to this um, agenda, particularly, again, with the focus on low, middle income and SIDS contexts. So back to you. 
No. Thank you, Ikushui. Very well brought out in terms of uh, what needs to be done. But just I have a, some sort of a rebound question and I think we have time for a second question. Maybe I'm not too sure about the second round, but this brings me to a follow-on question to you. While well, completely agreed on the points that you made on data information risk assessment, my question that goes out here is, yes, the private sector has capacity, needs to be involved. But would you think that this, is, this information is a public good and this needs to be a public investment because we are talking about coping up with disaster, making infrastructure resilient and therefore cannot have a private access to information in terms of building information or rather let's say risk data, physical risk and translating it to corresponding analytics. Is it a private business or should it be a public good which the state should bring forth because equally shared across information, across insurance companies. What's your view here? Thank you. So I think that fundamentally there is a need to invest in this as a public good. I think if we are um, open with ourselves <laughs> in considering the past few years and how our society has treated uh, to the risks that we have had to contend with, if you think about climate change, uh, if you think about COVID-19, uh, there is a lot more that needs to be done in terms of investing in global public goods around building understanding of what these risks are. And as an institution, the IDF is supportive of this. Um, but in that context, I will also say that there is an important role in terms of public-private partnerships because the risks not only affect the public sector, they also affect the private sector. Um, and within the IDF, there are several ways in which we've approached this. Uh, we believe that there are two fronts or two dimensions to tackling this issue. The first is how do we improve the availability and quality of this information that's available? And so that speaks to the architecture of making risk available. And as an institution, we are supportive of open risk modeling approaches and have done and invested quite a lot in terms of um, open risk modeling standards, but also interoperability standards that allow for a cross fertilization and exchange of information across both public and private sector. The second element is to do with how do we close that information gap? And this requires not only tools, but investments in capabilities that exist at a national level or even sub-national level. So for me, I do agree with your um, suggestion in terms of basic need, in terms of investing in risk understanding as a public good. Uh, but there's also, I think, a reconciliation that there has to be an element that also speaks and leverages the capabilities that exist within the private sector to advance uh, our, our resilience um, agenda as a whole. Thank you, Thank you, We might come back if we have some time, but let me move on from you to Dr. Satyapriya Rath, Additional Secretary, Finance Department, Government of Odisha. Dr. Rath, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, given that uh, you come from your working uh, as an Additional Secretary, Finance in Odisha, and Odisha also has often been considered fairly climate vulnerable in terms of uh, climate events. Uh, can you enlighten us on uh, government investments, infrastructure planning and resilient infrastructure with some examples if you could throw in uh, from your experience and we can then have a follow on question around that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, actually inviting me uh, to this uh, conclave. So uh, uh, to respond, uh, may I request uh, to uh, make a presentation so that uh, I would be able to give a, a kind of context and, and also the approaches. So thank you. Uh, a little short, anyway, but go please go ahead. Slide, yeah. Yeah, so uh, as uh, India is a very vast country uh, and, and it has a, a variety in in, uh, in climate context and, and, and different things. So Odisha, uh, let me just introduce Odisha, which is almost equivalent to many of the uh, small countries uh, so, so far as area and, and uh, population is concerned. Odisha is located in the eastern coast, so it is vulnerable to, uh, to uh, severe tropic cyclones. And 
it's its climate uh, uh, vulnerability has been uh, actually assigned as very high in in successive finance commission recommendations and uh, odisha's approach towards uh, uh, this uh, climate uh, change and and uh, this disaster resilience uh, is is, uh, is quite uh, substantial and uh, over the years we have uh, enhanced our capabilities in managing the disasters and in recent years we are working on uh, the resilience and uh, thankfully uh, uh, cdri uh, is a partner in, in in our approach so can i move to the next slide please so this actually gives a broad picture on the uh, level of vulnerability uh, the, the state is uh, in in last 20 years the state has uh, actually lost about 46% of its uh, its uh, gross domestic product to this especially this tropical cyclone so disaster resilient infrastructure is a priority for the state so that is one point i want to make here that this uh, severe uh, uh, calamities in the form of uh, tropic, tropical cyclones, they uh, bring a lot of uh, damages to power infrastructure, other uh, connectivity, and, and, and also uh, uh, salinity to the uh, uh, land which, which affects the crop uh, in, in successive years. So these are the broad areas which, which actually are our focus areas. And next slide, please. These are the uh, approaches uh, which the state government has taken up in, in recent years. Uh, the state uh, uh, Odisha was the first state to actually take up this uh, uh, state action plan on climate change and align it to SDG goals. And the uh, climate coding exercise is, is done by the state government so that the kind of vulnerability of the schemes and its, uh, its, its uh, uh, relevance and sensitivity is worked out so that it a, a kind of informed decision making can be taken towards the climate resilience. And Odisha is the only state which, is take, which has taken up fiscal risk management practices for last five years now. And uh, every year uh, the state is uh, bringing out a fiscal risk statement, which is a part of our vulnerability analysis also. And we have uh, in our uh, uh, appraisal stage also, each and every program is uh, actually analyzed from resilience point of view each infrastructure project, project as well as projects linked to uh, kind of farm uh, farm uh, sector and uh, other sectors are actually looked into resilience point of view uh, at the time of appraisal and we have been taking up few projects like uh, 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 world bank funded uh, what's a disaster recovery project for housing of uh, the most vulnerable areas of the people uh, for example for the uh, fishermen then uh, infrastructure for climate resilient growth is a program. Uh, it's it's a uh, uh, program which uh, is uh, done in, in uh, uh, four states, including Odisha, on piloting basis to look at resilient infrastructure under MG Energy primarily. But there are other components as well. And our partnership with CDRI uh, for improved design uh, to enhance the resilience of crit critical infrastructure primarily power infrastructure that is of very important for us next please so uh, this is an approach uh, uh, of of resilience through climate budget coding where uh, actually we we uh, work out it in in uh, from relevance and sensitivity point of view and it is a decision support system which helps us in in course correction in different programs including infrastructure projects as well as other projects Next, please. And uh, the ICRG program, which not only uh, looks into the MG uh, Norega uh, uh, resilience uh, uh, aspect of, of uh, uh, the uh, piloting, it also looks into a kind of model village uh, plan, which looks into all aspects of uh, 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 resilience, starting from infrastructure resilience, uh, then uh, uh, resilience towards uh, agriculture and uh, Odisha is one of the pilot states and uh, it, a lot of learning has come from this scheme which we are uh, uh, putting into different programs to see that those uh, projects and programs are disaster resilient and, and uh, disaster proofing is uh, also done wherever it is required. Next please. And these are the way forward. Basically, we uh, uh, do a kind of uh, we, we uh, do 
assessment of fiscal risk due to disasters in critical infrastructure sector primary critical infrastructure is uh, power infrastructure i talked about then coastal embankment is another area where we are focusing and enhancing power infrastructure uh, infrastructure to disaster resilient grid that is one of our approach this is a specific area where we are actually uh, taking uh, technical support from cdri and we are planning to achieve this disaster resilient grid power infrastructure in in, in next 4 to 5 years that is one of our major plans uh, is a, because power infrastructure plays a very vital role uh, uh, if it, it is not resilient to kind of uh, severe disasters it can have impact on many sectors like uh, you will not have drinking water uh, immediately after these disasters you will not have uh, connectivity uh, teleconnectivity internet connectivity everything will be uh, will be kind of uh, uh, affected uh, because of that so it is a priority and we are taking uh, support from cdri for this purpose then coastal protection or embankment that is another area where we are working on then climate adapt adaptive infrastructure at all places you you always don't want a kind of resilient infrastructure at, at certain areas you need to have adaptability in, in, in that kind of infrastructure then climate proofing wherever it is required and climate adaptive farming and livelihood practices these are also another areas where we are working uh, uh, in uh, in this state and we are taking support from various external agencies as well so uh, to uh, respond to your queries uh, this is what i have to say and for further queries i am uh, open thank you thank you thank you dr rath this is very brilliantly presented and it's very great to see long term policy planning policy tools being used mainstreaming disaster resilience into basic infrastructure and power infrastructure and so on as i as i get to the next question i know we are running short of time we may run short of time but this is a this is a question which gets directed that given all of these great initiatives in terms of looking at odisha's vulnerability but the question is how does this get financed now this is both increased revenue expenditure for you increased capital expenditure for you how do you manage on the budgets or is there some light you would throw on this session being on investments on financing resilient infrastructure how does this go how is this going to pan out and how do you look into the future with these investments increasing public investments both on the revenue side and the capital side thank you yeah uh, this uh, uh, planning actually require quite a lot of investment in in capex uh, especially and that uh, uh, has to be achieved through a kind of medium to long term planning the area which is more vulnerable has to be taken up uh, at the beginning but for revenue uh, side actually we have built up a kind of buffer so far so that uh, because of our uh, larger vulnerability we are creating a kind of buffer in, in our disaster management plan for uh, revenue expenditure but capex getting this uh, uh, resilient infrastructure needs substantial investment and if it is to be done through uh, uh, public investment it will take a lot of time so definitely private investment will also be a welcome step but we have to first work out on uh, the areas where we can uh, have public investment and where we can have private investment and uh, bringing in private players is also equally important in this sector oh thank you thank you if you have time on a second round we'll come back on that but thank you so much and let me move on to our next panelist uh, neha kumar climate bonds initiative south asia head so neha just from your experience in climate bonds how how does capital markets financial markets green financial markets very clearly green financial markets contribute to resilient infrastructure instruments ways globally developing countries up to you uh so thank you for this question and i think uh, our first speaker talked about uh having a common language of risks and then um mr rak talked about the the need for a large amount of public investment um to tackle uh, uh you know 
exogenous shocks in, 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 the, in the form of disasters, which can be acute weather-related events, but they can also be chronic. Uh, you know, when you have um, uh, rainfall patterns changing, your productivity losses happen across the sectors. So definitely you have to, like you said, uh, Juba, yourself, that uh, not only private investment, but also public investment will have to play a huge amount of role. Recalibration of finance will, happen, will need to happen across the spectrum. Now, how does that uh, recalibration happen and what are those actors who can come into this, um, uh, into this uh, world to draw in both the, you know, to, to manage the fiscal side of it and also to draw in more and more private capital because it will be required. So that, that goes beyond, uh, you know, uh, I mean, that it is, it is, it is, it's clearly understood, that need. Now, uh, coming to debt capital markets, uh, usually what we see is that uh, the volume that investors are ready to sort of put their money into tend to be large. You know, it is, these, are the, these are the bond markets. They, um, what you will find attractive for international investors or would probably just, as a thumb rule, they will look at anything above $200 million, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and why I'm talking about international investors in the first instance is that they're, at least in terms of the uh, thematic bond space, which is green bonds, which is right now, a whole lot of, go a whole lot of it is going into the mitigation aspect. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, the world over, green bonds right now uh, stand at about uh, you know, or other thematic bonds are also stand at about $3.5 trillion, out of which only 17% have gone to resilient infrastructure. And your own study, Climate Policy Initiative's own study has pointed out, and you know, globally it has pointed out, and even in the case of India it has pointed out, that the, the flows of finance into adaptation and resilience are minuscule. And coming from this uh, part of the world and looking at what emerging economies have to uh, face, their wherewithal in terms of mobilizing finance will always be much more constrained despite the fact that, not despite the fact, but in the face of larger degree of impact that they face, okay? So the priority for finance flows definitely lies within emerging economies and as the theme of this um, session goes, within LIDCs, within middle-income countries, but the flow of finance through private capital instruments has largely been restricted to de developed economies, okay? I just wanted to uh, now focus on what can aid that flow of finance in terms of common language. And that common language, we have a rather robust system of standards uh, which are looking at mitigation aspect of things. These are called taxonomies, these are international standards, there are jurisdictions which are now developing those taxonomies. Similarly, what you need to do is make a system of uh, definitions for resilience so that you can identify in a scientific manner that these resilience, uh, these, these uh, projects are credibly resilient. Now you might ask that resilience and adaptation are very context specific. There needs to be a larger amount of, uh, you know, uh, context specificity which needs to come in. Truly so. And I think uh, there are frameworks that MDBs have developed. There are principles that even Climate Bond Standard has developed. To introduce that complexity, uh, there needs to be something different from mitigation that happens in the adaptation investments. And that is, that it is at two levels, it plays at two levels. It plays at the level of the asset that you're creating, but it also plays at the level of the system boundaries. That system, you cannot sort of disturb the balance of either adaptation, you cannot disturb that, you know, uh, you are creating a reservoir here, but your larger uh, water flows are getting disturbed. And you also cannot, you also, you also cannot, uh, uh, or, or you also have to see that there is not a trade-off between Mitigation and ad adaptation, that's the kind of, uh, what should I say, the discourse that is happening now. So um, I do have a couple of slides and I don't think we need to go into those slides in great amount of uh, detail, but I just wanted to say that at the right now, the work on resilience standards is very limited 
it's, it is at the level of principles which have been developed by MDBs. Uh, Climate Bond Standards has developed those principles. Who has, who has come to the market? Governments, uh, 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 you know, Fiji sovereign bond was initially, was entirely devoted to resilient expenditures. And that's where I want to bring in the concept of more of governments and sovereigns and even, even sub-sovereigns coming into the market, borrowing that money from the market. Uh, the case and example is the Indian case where they have not limited themselves at the level of principles only to the mitigation but are also looking at adaptation measures. And when the government comes, and we have had a rather a successful bond issuance, uh, which was, you know, uh, in your own currency, in your own domestic markets. So it was even able to avoid the external sort of fluctuation of uh, uh, currency. But also what we found out was that international investors are equally interested in, in, in domestic currency. Now the same thing has been at least been demonstrated at the sovereign level, uh, sovereign issuance level by a couple of countries. But I have to say that in terms of private sector coming to the market, there is definitely a possibility, there is a definitely a huge amount of opportunity that lies out there. But because the, because the adaptation measures can't be monetized in the short term, the public uh, actors coming into this is absolutely critical to give this market a push. And we also know, uh, you know, UNNDRR colleagues are here, that we are working together in developing a resilient taxonomy, which is a global uh, sort of a taxonomy that will develop. Uh, but what I want to share also with the audience is that, you know, from broad principles, you have to come to very sort of criteria-driven approach so that uh, the investors and the borrowers, the issuers, are able to communicate across same kind of parameters and thresholds. And this is going to become extremely important if we have to draw in not only international money, but also draw in private money in any case. Or actually, a taxonomy gets applied to any kind of, you know, uh, deployment of a capital, right? Because it will be able to tell you what can be funded and what cannot be funded. So I will agree with uh, Mr. Rat uh, completely that um, a private has to come in, but I think a larger, the initial role has to be played by governments. These taxonomies can also be used to tag your budgets. And they need to see that, you know, these expenditures can actually be, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, looked at in terms of capital uh, uh, borrowing from external sources which are private. Thanks a lot, Neha. I, uh, for want of time, may not go into a next question, but I just want to rephrase and get to bullet points of what you made. Yeah, yeah. You, you made very useful, very different points at the same time. Taxonomy, disaster, resilient infrastructure, uh, needs a definition, needs a taxonomy, needs but you were making, and it needs a public investment, long term, and therefore short term, private may not be there. But when we are talking about it, and you may respond it in pretty much a, a short manner is, so are we saying that yes, it is possible to have disaster resilient financial instruments? I get the answer from you as yes. yes. And the second point that you're making is, they may primarily be seen from sovereign entities to start with or public sector to start with, if I get that point. I and then, hmm. how does private capital from markets come in if there are no business and revenue models? That's my only last question, the first two, complete agreement with you. And so how does capital from capital markets come in because they need to be repaid with the use of proceeds and here is disaster resilient infrastructure which Odessa invests. So that part only and quickly please. Yeah. Thanks. So um, uh, good questions again. Uh, the, it will probably depend upon the asset types which will be able mm -hmm. to give you say returns in the short or medium or long term. Uh, what we have seen uh, 
just taking the example of say if you have to create hard infrastructure right uh, that will require large upfront costs. In fact, all kinds of resilient investments require large amount of upfront costs. But um, having private actors come in over there, again, might be initially difficult. But what we have seen, just to give you another example, a sectoral example, huh? which is you can look at nature-based solutions, for example, in the agriculture sector, which is also important. Huh? The land use sector is also important in terms of uh, building uh, that resilience which is required. What we have seen is that there probably the big institutions, financial institutions find it slightly hard to come into the uh, capital markets because there is a problem for aggregation. I'm not saying that it is without challenges, but the, uh, the investors which are more in, on the impact side, right, which are slightly okay. the other yeah. side of uh, spectrum, are more easy to come into, uh, into those kind of investments. Uh, there was one question that you had said. Um, I think I'll just, uh, what I, why, why I want to emphasize the importance of these standards, taxonomies, is that even to create that pipeline, Hmm. You will need to be able to identify what is resilient and what. And right now, that common Missing. metrics does not exist, and I think that's an important one. No, thanks, Nia. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let me move on to our next speaker, to Mr. Mitheli Kama from Fiji, permanent secretary uh, from Fiji, with a portfolio on both disaster and uh, agriculture, if I'm not mistaken. There has rural and maritime development, a large portfolio, sir. So thank you so much for being here and coming back to saying whether I, I'll, I'll pose a question which is a wider than Fiji and let's take small island developing countries and we, we know very well that the vulnerability and the needs of SID is significantly are getting impacted because of climate change is showing up, the impact is showing up and there is not enough uh, that the world is doing there, let's put it this way. So, uh, any examples, any experience on good practices of resilient infrastructure either from Fiji or elsewhere and how is it that the SIDS should both financially uh, defend itself and both against climate and where are the gaps and how does, the, how does these countries address that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Druba. Um, Thank you very much uh, for, for the opportunity to be part of the, uh, the panel this afternoon. I have a, a few slides, um, sure. if, if uh, hopefully it can be available, right. Uh, can we move on to the second, uh, second slides? Okay, I just want to, to briefly uh, highlight the, some of the um, risk uh, and some of the natural events that we've been experiencing over the, over the last uh, 10 years or so. And it shows the, the significance of the, of the um, cyclone events and flooding events. Those are the two events that we, uh, we have been experiencing over the last uh, few years. And it's, uh, of course, having a lot of impact uh, in terms of our infrastructure uh, resiliency. And um, I think that's as part of our background. It's also uh, important for us to highlight, uh, highlight that. Uh, given that um, Fiji is at the uh, forefront of the uh, global effort to strengthen disaster and climate resilience by pursuing resilient infrastructure development and being on the front line of uh, uh, climate-driven disasters such as uh, T.C. Winston, we experienced that in 2016, and T.C. Yasa in 2020. And Fiji continued to take those uh, progressive uh, actions to address infrastructure development through build back better approach. Um, we, um, also fortunate for forums such as this to, to take stock of progress, uh, but also deliberate on how we can address challenges together that uh, continue to face us as we identify sustainable solutions to safeguard our infrastructure. As um, uh, correctly alluded to by Mr. Kamles um, in the inaugural session yesterday, uh, Fiji, like other seeds, know the challenges and barriers. And uh, however, through meaningful collaboration such as this, we need to start discussions on practical solutions. Solutions that are affordable, solutions that are scalable, and solution, solutions that can work for different uh, contexts. Um, if you move on to the, to the next slides, 
and, and following the, the, the impact of, uh, of disasters, uh, the government had been trying to, to um, try its best to open schools, um, repair health centers, and, um, and also uh, facilities. Uh, as is shown on the slides there, the, um, over the years we have been experienced uh, mostly uh, tropical cyclones and, and, and uh, flooding events. And uh, of course, during those disasters, our critical infrastructures were being affected. And uh, the livelihoods of many of those affected were significantly uh, compromised. And because of this, our economic activity are being disrupted. Uh, social impacts such as health and education are further impacted because of this. Natural disasters impact on our infrastructure sector therefore also set us back in progressing towards meeting our goals, our targets, and our commitment under the SDGs, Sender Framework for DRR, and the Paris Agreement. Um, in terms of the question that were posed to us, uh, if that can be reflected in the next slides, um, as already alluded to, that uh, due to the, uh, to the impact of uh, T.C. Winston, uh, with associated loss of lives and, and loss of a hard earth development. Um, maybe you can go to the, to the next slides, please. It, it, it provides an opportunity for, for government to take actions concerning the usually overlooked and neglect aspect of DRR uh, in Fiji. Uh, for, uh, for Fiji, the government took action by, reduce, by endorsing the National Disaster um, Risk Reduction Policy for 2018 and 2030. Recognizing that uh, if development is not risk informed, it will not be sustainable. Disaster risk reduction is now a priority for Fiji. Um, the, the adoption of the um, National Disaster Risk Reduction Policy showcases to the rest of the world that Fiji is no longer viewed as a disaster risk reduction, it's just a humanitarian issue, but a development one. Fiji is doing its best to ensure that the mainstreaming of our DRR is a norm rather than uh, exception. Um, however, uh, even though we have this um, NDRRP uh, uh, already exist, the challenges remain in meeting the 122 action items. Um, as rightly mentioned yesterday by uh, Ms. Uh, Mami Musituroi, Fiji faces the challenges of fully implementing horizontal risk governance within the government. The National Disaster Management Office continue to bear the load of advocating mainstreaming of DRR and not exactly ensure that uh, risk governance with budgetary allocation, government planning of major infrastructure development and build back, back uh, better uh, infrastructures. A number of underlying uh, disaster factors have increased our level of exposure and vulnerability of, to disasters. And this includes the number of uh, people living in disaster prone areas environmental de degradation and unsustainable development planning and rapid uh, urbanizations. Um, in terms of the, uh, the f next slides, um, but we all aware that uh, f um, of the challenges and Fiji um, in collaboration with partners have identified some solutions. The ministry ensuring that all projects are risk informed to ensure sustainability and improve on investment. Uh, in, this, um, in this regard, I think uh, the, um, the ministry has already piloted some of the projects in most of our rural communities. And, um, and uh, I think the, the, the ministry has already found some, uh, some benefits from those, from those pilot projects. Eh? I think for us going forward, uh, we just need to uh, scale up some of these projects just to ensure that uh, we advocate the, the importance and the benefits of having risk-informed projects within the, our, our, our line ministries. And I think we also, as I also already mentioned, that we, we need to advocate this risk-informed um, 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 idea, risk-informed concept to other line ministries as well, especially to our, um, to our, our ministries that are managing big infrastructure projects, such as uh, our, our waterways, our, our roads, and also our telecommunication uh, um, um, companies. These are the areas that we are targeting in terms of advocating that the importance of uh, risk um, um, informed development. Um, and also, um, um, as, as part of the uh, 
the, the next slides, um, you can see those are some of the few uh, examples of how are we being absorbing the, um, the risk-informed development uh, in, uh, in Fiji. You can see the, that the picture on the, on the slides, that's our new projects uh, we just uh, uh, about to complete. And it's taking into account all the risk elements uh, we have been discussed. Uh, you can see that uh, um, it's, it's taken into account the sea level rise and also uh, stronger tropical cyclones. Those are the uh, good examples of how we are taking the uh, risk-informed development uh, seriously. And we hope uh, that will provide a good message to, uh, to other line ministries and, and to the private sector on the importance of, of, uh, of having that, that kind of investment. But there are some risks as well. Uh, we've, uh, that's what we've been observing in, in the last few years. Uh, not on these projects, but similar projects, especially those that are located in the rural areas. Uh, the, the risk of the risk, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, these subject areas, it's very interesting for us because we, we have to understand the importance of risk uh, to the projects and also risk from the projects. And that is something that we uh, observe in, in most of our rural areas that is giving us the opportunity to try to, to correct some of those uh, development that we have been undertaking in the rural areas. Uh, of one of good example is uh, we have a, a, a similar bridge uh, crossing the uh, uh, rural communities, and we have been experienced that there's the flooding for, from the roads for, the, for those communities, given that the, it's generated from from the, the bridges that uh, that were built. So, um, in fact, I mean, if you look at the, the macro level benefits from those bridges, can be huge, but. It, it come at, unfortunately come at a cost to those communities that are living nearby. So those are the, uh, the, some of the key uh, messages they would like to, uh, to, uh, to discuss with the panel today. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the second question with regards to the gaps uh, in the infrastructure investment, um, the, one of the uh, challenges that we face is the, our archaic uh, building code. And, and that is an area that we are, we are trying to, uh, to review. The building code will, will ensure the um, acceptable standards of uh, structural sufficiency, fire safety, health, amenity, uh, to ensure that it's benefit to Fiji, not only for, for, the, for, for the present and for the future as well. And also, um, um, one of the challenges that we also face is the, uh, the, uh, the associated costs for, for us to adhere to those building codes. So I think uh, for a small island development country like us, that is also another, another challenge because of the limited fiscal space and our narrow economic base that's limited our ability to uh, constantly maintain uh, funding for, for their activities. And um, I think uh, also another challenge that we face in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the distance from our markets, especially from the uh, given the fact that most of our building materials are being imported from other countries, and we find that it's also um, uh, excavating the, the increases of cost of investing in resilient infrastructures. Um, the, the other um, um, challenges that we face in terms of the, uh, the uh, loss of skill, manpower, uh, due to migration and other factors, uh, particularly to, uh, in, in, in government agencies, uh, we've been facing those challenges when uh, most of our experience and technical officers are being um, either they migrate to, uh, to um, other countries for better opportunities or, and also to our regional partners who are based in Fiji, uh, giving them a better, better offer. Um, I think uh, as uh, I, I do support the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the point that was raised by one of few panelists uh, earlier with regards to the uh, lack of access to risk uh, exposure information. I think that's uh, an area that uh, most of our uh, Pacific Island countries are also facing the challenges in terms of ensure that we have a, a consolidated database where all our partners to, to access and use those database. And I think lastly, uh, in terms of the availability of funds, as I mentioned, due to the lack of fund, most of our uh, disaster-related investment projects has been delayed uh, for years now. 
good, some good example is our the huge demand for evacuation centers and also for our sea walls in most of our rural areas. We have a huge demand for, for those projects and it has been uh, delayed because of the limited funds uh, that we have. So I think um, that, that's, uh, that's all the, the, the gaps and some of the good practice they would like to share to the panel this afternoon. Nak. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kamar, for such a detailed description. And we also had risk-informed infrastructure, public policy, risk to the project, risk from the project. Quite interesting and very detailed for Fiji and maybe an example for SIDS. Let me just turn around and go to Mr. Ajay Rao, uh, U.S. Development Finance Corporation as one of the largest bilateral development financial institutions to look at how does DFC and Mr. Rao, if you can hear me, I uh, can't see you on the screen, but I hope you're there. Can you see me now? Yes. Yeah, I can see you now. And you can hear me and see me. Thank you. So how does DFC integrate disaster resilient uh, principles into its infrastructure investments? Or do you specifically look at uh, investing in disaster resilient infrastructure. I mean, either way you want to uh, respond, it's fine in your target countries, in your client countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. P P Kastaya. And thank you to CDRI for bringing us together. I'm, it's really my pleasure to be on such an esteemed panel of, of experts. Um, I'm Regional Managing Director for South Asia for the US International Development Finance Corporation. We're the US government's lending and investment arm, focusing solely on developing countries and uh, solely on the private sector. I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, offer a couple of slides to answer your question. Hopefully these are coming through. And what I hear the panel saying is that the devastating impacts of climate change are already here and are felt most severely in the places that can least afford to adapt. DFC knows that climate change has a disproportionate impact on developing countries, which are often more vulnerable to natural hazards given existing challenges with poverty, food insecurity, lack of access to energy and connectivity. DFC's development mandate combined with its diverse financing tools makes the agency an essential component of the United States ability to confront the climate crisis in developing countries and by extension globally. DFC has a role to play in developing countries by providing loans, guarantees, political risk insurance, investments and grants to support infrastructure resilience. We incorporate climate and disaster resilience when prioritizing transactions and in our evaluation of infrastructure projects. We look at it both for commercial reasons as well as development impact reasons. If a project fails because of climate change and our inability to assess that, if a project fails, the development impact fails. It is a DFC priority to provide loans and investments in climate adaptation. And today I have two examples, um, one from Cambodia and one from right here in India that demonstrates DFC's direct involvement in adaptation projects and building infrastructure to make developing countries ready for disasters and natural hazards. So DFC does transactions large and small, from as small as $5 million investments to up to 500 million. I've brought uh, to the panel here today two examples of smaller transactions to show how even um, smaller projects uh, can help with adaptation at a, at a micro level. Um, recently, DFC committed a $7 million loan to Khmer Water Supply Holding, um, KWSH, who owns a portfolio of private water operators that provide access to clean and affordable piped water across rural and semi-rural Cambodia. KWSH provides its customers with a cheaper, healthier alternative to water sources, such as surface water and household wells, which often lead to con consuming contaminated, wa contaminated water and a host of um, related health risks, as we all know. Um, on the impact side, their product helps to improve the quality of life for underserved populations, specifically women and girls who are dispro disproportionately responsible for water collection. 
if I bring the example of uh, a low-income uh, uh, household who previous to uh, purchasing the solution from KWSH, they would have um, obtained their water from, uh, from local pond water. Um, but the, the, the client and the prefers the sourcing water from KWSH since it saves them time, money, and provides convenience, uh, and most importantly, offers reliable, clean water 24, 24 hours a day. Think of a time of, of drought or time of a natural disaster where that pond may not be there, and his or her water uh, may not be there. So we need to build up um, at the local level, at the, at the village level, through making small changes, small micro uh, changes. I'll bring you now to um, my final example here in India. Um, and I see many development, uh, interesting development solutions um, with, that can uh, serve as lessons um, for at least developed countries and other countries um, in the health service delivery tr um, sector. So DFC provided a, a $4.65 million loan to Be Well Hosp Hospitals, who operates a network of nine hospitals in the state of Tamil Nadu. The sponsors um, sought DFC financing for five additional hospitals. So their model is that there were many of these single specialty hospitals, um, say a doctor that uh, had a pediatric clinic, uh, but that doctor was burdened with the management and administration. And they choose tier two and tier four towns away from the larger cities. So Be Well Hospitals will come in and manage staff, nursing staff, emergency care, and also a pharmacy, and make this a multi-specialty hospital in a two, in a tier two or three or a smaller town. So um, in India, um, Bilo has treated over 135,000 patients who, uh, of whom earn 50% uh, and earn below $6 a day. Um, when they do their surveys, over 46% of patients travel more than 100 kilometers uh, to seek medical care because 80% of doctors and 60% of hospitals are in large urban cities. Um, I, I would like us to, to look at health service delivery in terms of extending the affordability and access to care outside of the urban cities. Because if, as natural disasters uh, occur, um, we need our uh, populations to be able to walk less and be able to have access to uh, health healthcare services. So um, I will end my presentation there and uh, uh, back to you, uh, Dr. Tripp. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you. Thank you for the examples, illustration, illustrating uh, USDFC's investments in these areas in different developing countries. And we are moving on in the interest of time and let me uh, now go to Matthew of GDRR uh, of uh, UN Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. And uh, to Matthew, the question is, uh, I, th I think we are looking forward for some successful examples for financing resilient infrastructure in different countries from your work, uh, what capacities need to be built, what knowledge gaps we have seen in various, we have heard also. But any examples that you can share or any thoughts on? Building resilient infrastructure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, and uh, and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, very pleased to be here. I know uh, uh, it's been a two days conference, so I am really appreciate the fact that you are still in the room, uh, listening to our, one of our final panel, and uh, very grateful for for your attention uh, uh, on this afternoon. Um, maybe to answer your question, uh, I'd like to to differentiate a little bit what type of infrastructure we're talking about. Are we talking about, and I think there's a big difference if we're talking about housing, building, or if we're talking about water, energy, transport. And I think we have to draw a line there. And just coming back to what was said this morning by, by Miyamoto, if you want to add those uh, resilience element in the housing, how can you derive value for it? How, what is the incentive for you to actually make that one additional percent of investment to, to bring the residents into this? And, and one example, and we are, for instance, working closely with the IDF, and uh, uh, our dear friend was, was here uh, on the first panelist, um, to see if the insurance sector can also play a role to give um, 
incentive for, for actually the home owners to make uh, the additional investment by having reduced premium if you're taking the right, the right measure uh, that will reduce disaster risk uh, going forward. That's one way. Another example that we have seen uh, in the past was, was Italy uh, was sharing that after the earthquake they had was to see whether they can give fiscal incentives to uh, private uh, home owners to make um, a resilience investment uh, to protect their house against a future uh, risk of earthquake. So that was one other type of incentive structure. Lastly, on, on what we're discussing uh, this morning is if you can give a rating to your uh, assets to say, well, this asset is actually disaster proof, um, then it actually creates value for that asset. And that's a way to monetize actually the investment that you're making into that asset. So that's on the, on the resilient side. On the, on the infrastructure more uh, broadly, um, and uh, infrastructure asset like transport water, I think we have again to differentiate between what is new, um, new type of infrastructure assets and the one that are uh, already existing. On the, on the new aspect, um, I think some of the presenters were already uh, mentioning that uh, from, uh, from Odessa. Uh, um, he was already mentioning that uh, it's actually streamlined in the project preparation, in the, in the budget, um, in, the, in the way they are assessing project. So I think it's really when at the time of, of conception and planning that you can really influence. And, and that brings me to what you were asking about how we can get the private sector to invest. And, and a lot of, uh, of course, depending on what infrastructure asset you're talking about, those like energy or transport that can uh, create a revenue streams, uh, they can attract private investment. But at the, at the same time, it's the public that is making the, the procurement and through public-private partnership, for instance. And if you embed uh, a resilience aspect into your uh, PPP structure, you actually create an incentive, well, it's an incentive, more than an incentive, you are actually mandating the private sector to make those investments to ensure that the resilience of those assets will, uh, will uh, exist down the line. And, and I think that's something, for instance, if you look at the force majeure clause in terms of uh, PPP, uh, what is the responsibility of the private sector if there is a natural hazard? Uh, and, and make sure that you keep certain responsibility for the private sector to actually cover those, those risks. I think that's one, one element that is uh, very important. Um, on the existing asset, um, do you have, uh, it's difficult to, to derive a revenue stream from those if you are actually increasing the resilience. And so that's also coming back that a lot of investment will have to be made by the public. Um, and that could be financed through resilience bond or the bond market by, by actually uh, share, uh, looking for, for capital market investment. And I think there, um, what we are looking at is to see if there is a way to create structure, blended finance structure that will um, allow uh, governments uh, in developing countries to borrow uh, and use capital market, but to access financing at a lower, a lower cost. And I think that's something that uh, could have a, a lot of potential because capital market for, for developing countries or for certain developing countries is, is, can be very pricey. And so if we can find a way to have a blended finance structure that will uh, reduce the cost, uh, then we create again an incentive uh, for, for those countries to stop delaying the, uh, the necessary investment in, in resilience, but actually uh, to be able uh, to debt them. Um, last point, uh, and I know we, we are short on time, but uh, um, I think also looking at for your existing uh, assets, um, le, we discussed a lot about stress testing and, and, and doing a review. I think it's important to, to do that because that's where you will identify the pipeline of project uh, for building resilience. That's when we do use stress testing, you see what's not working, you see where the risks are, and then you can, uh, you can proceed with the, with the investments. And, and, and I think that's something, uh, again, we are trying to work at, at UNDR in collaboration with CDRI, for instance, in certain countries to review um, their existing assets, uh, existing policy to see where, where the investments uh, are, are necessary. So I, I'll stop here, um, but uh, thank you for the no. opportunity. No, thanks, Matthew. You make many important points. I'll have to have a follow-on question for you if I can unpack it correctly. 
You made a point that resilient infrastructure is X percent higher and there's X percent higher or 1 percent which you said. Higher in cost needs to be built in into the specs of public-private partnerships at a government procurement. And then you brought in insurance saying the premiums for insuring that would be lesser. So you made these three points in the connection of saying how does resilience infrastructure get financed? One, capex goes up. So public expenditure may go up if it is PPPs, public-private partnerships, then again the capital expenditure goes up. So therefore there is a higher cost of financing. What I'm unable to, what, I, what we need to understand here is existing infrastructure where actually premiums are going up if there are vulnerable areas or higher physical risks. How do you relate reduced premiums to financing of resilient infrastructure? If you could, you, if, I, if I got it wrong, please uh, correct me. If I got it right, please explain. No, I think it's, uh, I mean, on the, on the PPP uh, aspect, for instance, if you have, uh, indeed you might have a bit higher capital expenditure at the beginning, uh, but if you take this 20 years contract, you have actually uh, a long period of time to, to actually recoup those investments. So you are, you are in a, an horizon where, where you have, and we know that the, the resilience investment uh, pay off in the long run. Um, and so that's, that's one way. On the, resi on, the, on the premium, I don't know, I'm not sure I understand uh, the question exactly, but if it's talking about uh, a household premium for, uh, for disaster, uh, you can embed that, you can give, the, the insurance sectors can provide reduced premium to house, uh, uh, home owner <coughs> sure. if, if they are taking the right uh, uh, risk reduction measure. On the blended finance that I'm mentioning, then you need concessional finance from donors, and that's the only way you can reduce yes. the premium. Yeah. Uh, and what we are trying to see, if it's possible to create a, a structure uh, where blended finance would be used to reduce the, uh, the interest rate uh, for governments that are making uh, sure. investment in resilience. So that's, that's I hope. No, uh, yeah, it that. does, it does, it does, thanks. And it just relates to what the point Neha made in terms of defining resilience, I agree. The resilience needs to be defined and built in before you build that built infrastructure and get it. Points, thank you, thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, last but not the least, and whatever time I have, Dr. Anand Patwardhan is all yours in terms of telling us how to demonstrate profitability of disaster resilient infrastructure, which, sorry, it just beats me, profitability, but still over to you and happy to take this forward with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dhruva. And uh, I do have some slides, but I think in the interest of time, let me skip that. Um, so I think you raised a sort of perhaps left the most difficult question for the last because we have heard lots of really neat ideas about resilient infrastructure. But of course, uh, if you can't get it paid for, it won't be built. And if you have to get it paid for, it has to generate a return, especially if the source of that money is private capital. So the question is, what's the return? Right? So I'd maybe rephrase the word profitability to return on investment. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, I think I really appreciate Neha's starting off with this question of taxonomy uh, and metrics because what is the it that you want to get paid for? And in this context, I want to slightly differentiate between uh, resilience of infrastructure and resilience through infrastructure. So the first category is really where we are talking about things like climate proofing. We have infrastructure, we want, we now, uh, believe that it may have to end the example that a colleague here from Fiji gave, you know, how do you uh, redesign a bridge or the increment, the resilience increment, if you will, to respond now to a 100 years forecast of sea level rise, right? So that's kind of the, the climate proofing aspect where you're taking infrastructure and there's an increment that comes because you want to make it more resilient. But there's a second category, which is that at the end of the day, infrastructure is uh, enabling economic activity, communities to function, societies to function. So there's a question of the infrastructure that will then deliver resilience benefits to communities that are dependent on it, right? And so I think that's kind of, it's worth differentiating between these two because they have slightly different implications. So if you take that as the starting point, uh, some of the work we have done through the Global Commission on Adaptation uh, conclusively demonstrated that uh, investments in adaptation and resilience pay off. 
Right? So we did large meta-analysis of, of many projects and you found benefit cost ratios of anywhere from four is to one to sometimes even nine is to one. Obviously, this has been well demonstrated for early warning systems, but it's also been demonstrated for many other categories of investments in adaptation and resilience. And in that process, we identified three dividends, so if you will, three sources of return on investment. The first source, the first dividend is the ob most obvious one, which is avoided or reduced losses. So if you have a resilient infrastructure and you're able to reduce future losses, then that's excellent, that's a direct benefit. The second dividend is what you might call as an induced economic benefit. One of the reasons that, the, uh, that we often talk about the Thames barrier in, the, in London is because it enabled the development of Canary Wharf and essentially enabled that the reduction of risk enabled greater investment to flow into a region because there was perception that this was, uh, this was less risky. Right? So it's kind of an induced economic benefit. And the third dividend is what we call as co-benefits. So these are social or environmental co-benefits. So if we do coastal restoration, we do mangroves, you might not only provide coastal protection services, but also benefit, uh, there may be environmental benefits or other social benefits. It's right? so sort of the co-benefits. So the economics is compelling, but economics, good economics doesn't mean that money will flow. And money doesn't flow for, I think, three reasons, again. With the first dividend, uh, you do have uh, reduced or avoided losses, but those are future, those are contingent, and they're uncertain. So unless you have an intermediary that is able to securitize or able to convert that avoided loss, or effectively a savings, uh, into a revenue stream, it still doesn't work. The second dividend is also real and large. There are induced economic benefits of risk reduction, but those benefits are often very dispersed, they accrue to many different actors, including private actors, and who have no direct connection to the investment that brought that risk reduction in the first place. So there's again a mismatch here. There's an Asian problem. And the third dividend is again real, again large, but it's often intangible, non-monetary. It could be a public benefit. Or it could be a public good. So it's not really something you can, you can capture. So really, that is sort of where the, the crux lies, is you need uh, to figure out ways by which you, you can tap these returns, which are real and which are significant, but convert them in a way that allows actually the flow of finance to be enabled because you're generating returns. So earlier you mentioned this question about insurance uh, in, in the previous. So one, of, so one of the questions is, could the insurance sector do for resilience what ESCOs did for energy efficiency? So one of the problems with energy efficiency is exactly the same thing. We underinvest in energy efficiency because the benefits are savings. There's a principal Asian problem, those savings are not captured. So you have energy service companies that can essentially capture those savings and convert that into a revenue stream that can pay for the upfront cost, the upfront higher capex of that investment in a more efficient uh, you know, appliance or more efficient piece of equipment. And so one of the questions is, what will that intermediary look like in the resilience space, which can essentially take that first dividend of savings or of reduced or avoided losses and convert it into a revenue stream that can pay for an initial upfront investment. In the same way, uh, for the second dividend, and this is where I think the idea of uh, blended finance comes in because you need to be able to often pay for those second and third dividends through some combination of public finance which can come from a combination of revenue generating sources. So again, I think there are solutions uh, and all I would suggest that these three ideas of intermediation of blended finance uh, can really form uh, ideas and the right kind of financial instruments, I think these three together can allow you to convert what's good economics into sustainable uh, revenue models. Thank you. Very well explained, Dr. Anand Patwadhan. I just have one very short follow-on question. I can see the time, mm. but yes, completely agreed with you on the three social economic benefits. High economic rates of return not contestable at all. Where the struggle rise is, arises here is, how does this translate to even 
justifiable financial rates of return. We always say economic EIRR needs to be greater for a social investment. For a infra it's the same argument for infrastructure, if it is resilient or not, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we argued for infrastructure similarly. The question is, then this, this has to be paid out by way of government procuring because government is the only way which can internalize these benefits and the market which is so distributed cannot pay for it. We have the externality argument back again and therefore private investment from private capital market does not seem feasible. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you for that. So uh, just very briefly, I mean, I think the challenge here is you have a very interesting mix of public and private costs and public and private benefits. And the challenge is to, and this is why I said sort of the, the two key aspects here is intermediation and instrument design. Because I agree with you that a lot of that internalization takes place by the government, right? Because if you have distributed benefits, then you can say, well, you can sort of recoup that through general tax revenue, for example. But I think this is where instruments, and I think Neha's points about dedicated instruments becomes really interesting because those instruments then offer you a more direct way. So these are now not general tax, rev general exchequer, but these are now more direct special purpose vehicles that are directly getting the people who are experiencing those benefits uh, to come into paying for the uh, upfront investments. Thank you. Thank you. We are just on time, five seconds from zero. I kind of tried it to keep it. Thank you so much. Thank you, all the panelists. And so I'll hand it over to the organizers. And thank you all so much. So thank you, Dr. Dhruva and all the panelists. We just wanted to hand over three certificates to all of you, except uh, Dr. Anand, because he has already received his yesterday. <laughs> so to the rest, we'll try our best. So, so we would just want, uh, I would request Dr. Dhruva to please uh, hand over these certificates to our panelists, and I shall hand his certificate to him. So thank you to all of you.